Now here's a word that comes up very often, but is pretty scary to most. And that word is a budget. Now, many times when people hear the word budget, they think, oh man, this means I can't spend money on the things I like. And in reality, the term budget just means controlling how much you spend on certain things. Matter of fact, if you looked up the definition of a budget, it says that it's a spending plan based on your income and expenses. And that's exactly what it is. It's just a plan. It's not saying that we can't buy the things that we want. It just gives us constraints and control over how much we spend for the things that we want. Now, this applies not only to our personal lives, but it can be translated over to business as well. So in this video, we're gonna talk about how to create a budget in six simple steps. And we're not just stopping there though. We're gonna break down these steps and give you different examples or different strategies that you can use. So it's not just, you know, cut and paste. You can really make something that's for you, right? It's unique, it's authentic, and it works. And we sprinkle this thing with bonuses. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're watching to the end. So we're gonna start this off with step one, which is actually choosing a goal. Now the goal plays an important part here because because otherwise, what are you kind of saving for? And let's use an example here. Let's just say, hey, look, I'm, I'm gonna cut down this spending so I can really put money to the side. And then you're gonna ask yourself, well, what am I using the money for? If we just have this pile of money off to the side, well, then it's likely that we're gonna spend it on something that doesn't really work towards our favor. Maybe it's something we desire, right? But maybe it doesn't help us get to a specific financial goal. So by understanding exactly what goal that we want out of this budgeting plan, we now can at least create a system. And you're gonna see in these other steps why the goal is so important because how we choose to actually budget is gonna play a part of that. So let's talk about a couple of different examples for a goal. Uh, one example can be just paying down debt. And debt obviously comes in many different forms. Some of us have student debt and it hurts, right? And even though somebody said that they were gonna forgive student debts a couple of times and then they didn't do it and now our hopes were up and now we're like, yo, what happened to the student debts? Why well, I still got student debts? That's the thing, right? And some of us have credit card debt or consumer debt, right? And maybe it's a, a debt with Macy or with whoever, I don't know. Maybe TJ Maxx has a credit card now. Amazon, Amazon gives out credit cards now so you can buy more stuff on Amazon. Who knew? Another goal could be simply, hey, I'm ready to retire early. There's an entire movement out there dedicated to this. It's called the FIRE movement, financially independent, retire early. And the whole concept of this community is how do I get out of the nine to five rat race before retirement age of 62 through 65? Now, what that may look like for us is how do we reduce our expenses enough that our current income can cover that, right? Or our passive income can cover that. Another extremely popular strategy when we're considering retiring early is building up our investment portfolio enough that the dividends pay us how much we need in order to live passively, right? And so this can come obviously through real estate. That's a very popular one, but it also can be dividend investing through stocks and through bonds. Now, the formula for that, we can make a whole video based on that, but we have to understand essentially how much money is coming from this stocks and bonds that are dividends for us to actually use. And so a very popular rule when it comes to that is the 4% rule. Now the 4% rule says that whatever you need to live on, all right, that's going to be 4% of the total amount of assets that you have in stocks and bonds. And so your stocks and bonds portfolio will then be calculated based on 4% to tell you exactly how high it needs to be. So let's do this as an example, let's say that you need $50,000 in order to retire early. If you had $50,000 in passive income, that's more than enough to cover your monthly expenses. Well, if we were to divide 50,000 by 4%, that gives us a total of $1,250,000. So what this means is we need to have $1,250,000 in stocks and bonds so that when they pay that 4% dividend, we can actually live off of that passively. Another good example of a goal could be something revolving around your children, right? Uh, maybe it's your education in the future. Maybe you want them to go to college. Maybe you're setting up um, your children's trust fund. Maybe you ball them like that and you wanna make the next, you know, the, the next Trump. And regardless of how you feel about Trump, positive or negative, I mean, maybe you wanna create a legacy, right? So your kid can be a billionaire when, when they hit 18. Another example for a goal can be uh, emergency funds, right? Maybe it's just, hey, I need this safety net so I'm not panicking every single month. I just need to have this safety net here so I know that if something slips up, I have something to go to to kinda, to kinda cover the situation. And you know what? Maybe your goal isn't you know as profound as any of these. Maybe 
it's just, hey, look, I'm trying to budget so I can save up enough money to buy the car that I want or go on that amazing vacation that I've been dreaming about for the past 10 years. And no matter what your goal is, it's perfectly fine. There's no judgment, right? This is your money. You work for the money. You can do what you want to do as long as you have a goal. Now let's move along to step two, which is calculating your net income. And when we talk about net income, we're basically saying, what's your take home pay, right? After Uncle Sam digs in your pocket and you got FICO, Medicare, FICA aid, and all these other things, right? What's the amount that actually hits your bank at the end of the day? Now there's two different schools of thought when we look at what actually hits the bank account. And the reason I'm saying this is because some people have employer benefits, right? 401k, uh, IRAs, things of that nature. Uh, and some would say that this money that you're contributing towards this retirement account still counts towards your budget. So for example, let's say that $5,000 was your gross pay. That's essentially what you make every month. And then you decided to contribute $1,000 into the IRA, right? And so although at the end of the day, after taxes and everything, let's just say you took home $3,500, all right? Well, some will say, hey, that $1,000 that you contributed over to the IRA, that's still a part of your budget. And you should count that as a thousand dollars towards your, your retirement budget plan, right? That category. And some would say, hey, look, no, because it's automatically deducted, let's just focus on actually what hits your bank account and then create budget categories around that. And to be quite honest, that decision is up to you. If you wanna allocate that retirement account, even though it's automated and say, yes, this is my thousand dollars, for example, that goes towards retirement every month, let me make sure I hit that quota. And whatever's left, we'll just continue to make categories from there. The key objective here is that we need to understand exactly how much money we're working with, right? How much money do we actually have to spend on all of our necessities, all of our desires, and all of our goals? which leads us into step three, which is now we need to track our expenses. So this is the method that I used and it worked for me and it, and it might work for you. So I printed off those bank statements, right? And I looked at each one of the expenses that were there and I made sure that I highlighted them, right? Because you've seen the bank statements, they're real fine print. Sometimes we don't know what they are, but I highlighted every single expense. And oftentimes there's ways for you to filter through your bank statement to only look at the expenses. And some bank statements literally just have your credits and your debits already separated and so you could just print off your statement and just look at the debit section. Now once we have all of our debits compiled essentially we're going to move on to step four which is the deep dive. So the deep dive is just that. We're really going to start to dig into these expenses and really start to understand them but it first starts with one simple question. Are you actually on budget, under budget, or over budget? And I know you haven't even created a budget yet but the question becomes, are you spending more money than you're actually taking home? And this is a very simple concept. Once you understand your net income and once you calculate all of your expenses back in step three, you'll know if you're spending more than you're actually bringing in. And if you are, that's an immediate red flag. Why? Because that's how we go broke. When we start to spend more money that we don't have, we're probably putting that money on credit cards or different loans or borrowed money, which is just a recipe for disaster. So it starts there. That's the first question. Are we spending more than, uh, than we're actually making? Now, once we realize that, now let's figure out where we're spending money on. And we're going to do that by categorizing all of our expenses. Now, there are many different ways to categorize it. We can get super niche down and specific, but I just like to separate it into a few different categories. So the first one is going to be our, our housing category. And underneath this category, we still want to subcategorize it, but these are things that are going to include maybe our rent, right? Or, or our mortgage payment, okay? And this would include an HOA or a COA if you have that in your community. The next thing is going to be utilities. So utilities can be your electricity, right? Your water, your internet. It could be your lawn care services if you have it. If you pay for trash services at your apartment or at your home, boom, let's go ahead and throw that in there. Um, if you have to pay an additional pet, fee. Let's make sure that that's included, so forth and so on. And under your home category, you could also just put in your phone, right? Your cell phone. And yeah, that's not tied directly to the home, but nonetheless, it's something that you need. And that's a great category to kind of throw that in. Now, the next category I like to do is a food category.
category. And in that category, we wanna see some subcategories here. We wanna talk about our groceries, how much are we spending at the store, but more importantly, we wanna see how much we're spending dining out. Let's be honest. Now, there's a few of us that really enjoy, you know, cooking at home and eating at home and home good cooked meal and all that good stuff. But there's a good chunk of you that love some convenience of maybe fast food or just going out to a restaurant or you know you can't cook as good as they do down at the steakhouse, right? And that's fine. But we still want to track that expense so we know how much are we actually spending on food. Another category that's going to be extremely important is an entertainment category. Now, this this is a catch-all, right? This is an umbrella term. And basically we're saying, hey, did I go to the movies? Did I go to Top Golf? Uh, did I go shopping? Uh, you know, whatever the case may be, that can be its own category. Now, when it comes to shopping, I mean, you can set that out for yourself and you could say, hey, this is how much I spent on clothes. This is how much I spent on makeup. This is how much I spent on you name it, right? And you can really start to break those categories down too. And, and like we said in the beginning, the more information you have, the better the decision-making process can be. So don't be afraid to really get in there and start to kind of bulk these into subcategories like this because it's gonna help you really figure out where your money is going. Now, one category that could easily fall in entertainment but should probably be separated is a vacations category, right? Or you can call it a travel category. And so this is gonna be everything from your airfare, like the tickets to the flight, uh, how much you paid for an Uber or a cab or whatever, a bus ticket, how much was your hotel lodging, uh, how much did you pay for food while on vacation or while traveling, so forth and so on. And the reason I like this separate is because entertainment is something that we're probably gonna do frequently throughout the year, even if it's once a month, twice a month, five times a month, 10 times, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be reoccurring most likely throughout the year. Whereas vacation and travel, obviously depending on your lifestyle and, and, and your job and many other things, a lot of times the travel is a little bit more spread out. And so it's a unique situation where we go and travel and you know we start to spend money based on that, that, that experience, whatever that may look like. So by us creating a budget around that, again, it gives us the freedom to do everything that we wanna do just within limitations within the you know control parameters which may not sound sexy to a lot of you but it sounds sexy when you think about finance okay so now we have the categories laid out so i want you to lump everything in there but then if you can break them down into those subcategories and we really start to line out exactly how much money is spent in these specific directions now we go back to that original question am i spending more than i actually bring home right or am i spending less than i bring home and we can see exactly where the money's going so hey if i'm if this month i spent uh let's just say theoretically three thousand dollars on clothes that's a lot of money in a month but hey maybe you balling and you want you know three thousand dollars worth of clothes that's perfectly fine but three thousand dollars on clothes and then all of a sudden you see that you're over how much you bring home by fifteen hundred dollars for an example then hey it's too easy maybe i don't buy as many clothes next month maybe i cut that out maybe these clothes last me for two or three or four months right i mean if you're anything like me i don't spend that much money on clothes period and my clothes last me a decade I'll be honest with you i get slack for it all the time i pull something out i'm like whap, 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 whap. yeah this is uh, this is from high school you know, you know that, that's me so maybe you don't have to be that frugal with it but hey it's an option right but we, as you can see is once you really start to identify where the money is going now we can start to think strategically and we can ask ourselves do i need to spend this much money in these areas is there a way that i may be able to skim it down another great example is groceries grocery prices have skyrocketed they're astronomical compared to what they were even a, a decade ago let, let alone when i was a kid and we see things on the aisle and i mean only think about you know our, our great grandparents when they were saying that they were buying things for a nickel Oof, I wish right but when we start to look at groceries now I'm, I'm not saying that you have to reduce the quality of the food right because some people including myself we're, we're conscious of what we consume because we know it applies to health however it may make us more conscious about trying to find better deals and maybe that's snipping coupons who knows right maybe that's uh, um, buying in bulk at Costco or, or, or B DJs or Sam's. Either way it goes, it allows us to be creative and to control how much we're spending in each one of these categories, which leads to the next step of choosing a budget plan or a budget strategy. Have you ever heard the term, there's a million ways to skin a cat? Well, that sounds kind of brutal and I'm pretty sure Peter would not stand for that comment now, so please don't cancel me. But the saying still stands, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can kind of cut this thing up. We have to pick a strategy and a, and a system that works for us. Now, there are many strategies out there, 
but I'm gonna cover five today. And the first one is gonna be the most glaring, obvious choice out there, which is no strategy at all. It might sound kind of funny, but hey, if you don't have a strategy, that is still a strategy. And obviously we don't want that. So let's go ahead and get to strategy number two, which is zero sum budgeting or zero based budgeting. Now, by the way, all of these budgeting styles have been around for quite some time, but they have been made popularized by certain individuals. And this style of budgeting has been made popularized by Dave Ramsey himself. And what zero sum budgeting means is that every single penny is going to be spent every single month. Now, I know that may sound scary, but one of the categories is gonna be savings, right? Or investing. And all that means is that every dollar, every penny has a purpose. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and do an experiment. If your system of whether you should buy something or not, it was ever pulling up your phone and seeing if you had enough money in the bank account, would you say, yep. And don't be ashamed because we all do it from time to time. But if that was ever the case for you, you fell right into a natural law called the Parkinson's law. And the Parkinson's law says, hey, look, if we have it, we can spend it or we can use it. And oftentimes that kind of hurts us because we look at this money that could be easily used more effectively effectively somewhere else, but we're like, hey, it's in the bank account. It ain't gonna hurt to put 20 here, 50 here, 30 here. And before you know it, $1,500 are gone on miscellaneous expenses. So zero-based or zero-summed budgeting eliminates all of that because we know every single dollar goes somewhere. And with that being said, we're gonna have our different categories. We're gonna have our housing expense. We're gonna have our entertainment expense. We're gonna have our travel expense. Then we may have a savings expense. We may have a investing expense. And you know what? We might even have a miscellaneous expense. So we can still go to the gas station and pick up what we'd like and not feel guilty about it. We just know that we can't overspend but you know above whatever amount that we decided for that month now the second style of budgeting is called the pay yourself first method now what this means is obviously we need to make sure that we are fed we need to make sure that we're enjoying life and a lot of times we might find ourselves living paycheck to paycheck during rough times or maybe you're starting your own business and you know the business isn't up and running or maybe it's just it's just hard and by paying ourselves what we at least allow us to do is make sure that we have enough money to go out and just enjoy the small things in life maybe maybe it's not going uh, to, to the movies and traveling maybe it's just getting a, a pizza delivered for, for once right maybe it's taking the kids somewhere special maybe it's just you going away and, and having some alone time and not needing to work every single second of the month right for, for the paycheck now the way this works is we're gonna take that number right the pay yourself first number maybe it's a couple hundred bucks maybe it's a couple thousand bucks whatever that number is and we're actually going to make it like an expense so when we go back to our budget now we're gonna see exactly how much money we take home whatever that amount is and then we're going to start to separate our expense categories. We put this money over here for this, this money over here for this. We talked about savings, we talked about investing, and then there's going to be a pay yourself first expense. Now, by the term, I'm pretty sure you can guess that pay yourself first means it's the first expense on the list. Now, the reason this is so important is because that means you don't sacrifice here, right? Let's say, for example, you listed out all the other expenses and then you put pay yourself first last. Well, by by that time, what you're saying is whatever is left over after all of these expenses are taken out, that's what I'm going to use to pay myself. But that kind of defeats the purpose of this specific method. In this method, you're going to put yourself first. You're going to make sure that whatever that amount is, you make sure you get it because that's for you. And then the rest goes towards these other expenses. Again, sometimes it might be hard if you have a tight budget, but this empowers that creative juice to say, all right, well, how creatively can I be with all these other expenses to maybe consolidate some of these, maybe renegotiate with the utility company. Maybe I don't leave all the lights on in the house. Now I understand why my mom yelled at me constantly as a kid for that. Now the next budgeting strategy is called the 50-30-20 rule. Now this is a simple method here that allows you to break up all of your expenses into three different categories and buy expenses. So the way that this one works is we're gonna take our take home pay and we're gonna divide it into three categories. And this is gonna be our needs, our wants, and our savings. 
So 50% of our take home pay is gonna to go to our needs and needs are just that. What do you need to survive? So this is gonna be your rent or your mortgage, right? This is gonna be your car note. This is gonna be groceries, all of your utilities, right? Your, your phone bill, because let's be honest, you could probably survive without a phone, but ooh wee, it's gonna to be tough. This is gonna be everything that you consider necessary in order to operate and live and function in your current lifestyle. And when we're talking about wants, we're talking about the, the niceties of life, right? The luxuries, the things that we don't need, but we really want. This could be our vacations, for example, right? We don't need vacations. We need some off time for sure. And so taking time off is highly recommended, but maybe we don't need to go to Bali this year, right? Or maybe we don't need uh, to go to Paris, right? Maybe we just drive down to the beach as an example, right? So it's not a necessity, but it's still recommended. So you want to put that there in the wants. Uh, streaming services is a great one. I mean, now there's everything is streaming, right? If you have cable now, you're actually behind the times because you can get anything on demand with Netflix, Hulu, Prime Video, uh, HBO Max, and I'm sure I'm missing 10 million other ones, right? But this is where you're gonna put in that category. Oh, 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 here's a tip, guys. If you know somebody with an account, borrow their account information, man. Anyway, you probably already knew that. And uh, that's all gonna go into the one section there, right? So shopping, vacations, um, streaming services, um, theme parks, movies, Top Golf, all of that stuff is gonna go into the once. And the last 20% is gonna to go to your savings. And savings will be synonymous for this, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's savings or it's paying down debt, okay? So when this money, this 20% goes in, obviously it's going to pay down student loan debt perhaps, credit card debt, car debt, your, your mortgage, or it's going towards savings. And savings can be your emergency fund. It could be your child's education plan. It could be a retirement account, right? It could also be an investment account. Maybe you're just putting money aside to then invest, right? But nonetheless, 20% of that take home pay is gonna go towards that category. Now, another budgeting style can be the envelope method. Now, this is that old school one that maybe your, your grandparents may have taught you or maybe your parents, but this is where, you know, you get an envelope and on the outside of the envelope, you can write whatever this category is. So maybe we put groceries, all right? Maybe we put house on one envelope and that includes your rent and your utilities and all that. Maybe we put another note, uh, another envelope that says savings, right? And maybe another one for uh, school supplies, right? And the list goes on. But when you get your money at the end of the month or at the first of the month, whenever that paycheck comes in, you get your take home pay. Now what you do is with that cash in hand, you slide through it and you put however much you need in each each one of those envelopes. So now when you go out, let's say you have a groceries envelope and you need to go to the grocery store, you only take that envelope and whatever's in there, that's how much you can spend. Now I do not expect any of you to be walking around with nothing but cash and an armful of envelopes, all right? So this has been modernized today and you can do the same thing with bank accounts, all right? And so bank accounts can be, maybe you name a bank account groceries, right? And then you create another checkings account and you name this one house, you know, or whatever, right? Mortgage. You name the other one vacation and entertainment. Now I know that sounds kind of complex, but you get the idea there. So now I'm going to throw in a bonus here. You know, you can absolutely choose any of these or you can choose a combination. And a perfect example of a combination is, uh, is a method that was made popular by Mike Michalowicz called Profit First. The Profit First method actually combines the envelope method, the pay yourself first method, and the zero sum budgeting method. And so the way that it generally works is there's five bank accounts. Now those five bank accounts was gonna be your income account, your operating account, right? The money that you really use to spend within your day. You're also gonna have a profit account, right? Then you're gonna have an owner's comp account or owner's compensation, owner's pay, owner's benefit. And then you're gonna have a tax account. Now, the way that these broke down was your income account. This is where all of that take home pay sits into that bank account. So once all of that money is inside the income account, then what we're gonna do is we're going to allocate them by percentages into all the other 
accounts, right? So the income account by the end of the month should be at zero and everything else should be put into those other envelopes, right? So we have our zero sum based uh, budgeting based on our income account. Then we have our individual envelopes or individual bank accounts. Now, the reason this is called the profit first method is because it's like the pay yourself first. We wanna make sure that the profit is actually written down as like an expense on your budget. And then we're going to move money over there at the end of every month. Now, full clarity, this method was made for business businesses, so it may not directly translate to, to many people's lives, but the concept is still the same, right? And so maybe instead of a profit account, you have a vacation fund, right? Or, or, or a reserve account, right? Like a savings account. And then for the owner's compensation piece, that's where you're taking your compensation, what you're going to walk away with, right? And it's the same concept there. If we pay yourselves first, how much money are we going to put in there? The tax account, that was meant to put money aside. So when the tax man comes by the end of the year, you don't have to come out of pocket pocket if you don't get a refund, right? We want to make sure that we have something there that we can kind of throw at the tax man so we don't have to be like, dang, I owe $4,000, I owe $10,000, I owe $20,000, whatever it is this year. Where am I going to get that money? And now you're struggling to, to pull money from other places. And now that final account, that operations account, this is basically like your main checking account. This is the one where you got the debit card actually attached to this one and you go out and you swipe for groceries and you swipe to pay your car note and so forth and so on. Now, the way that we do this here, yes, you may wanna add some additional buckets inside of that OPEX account so you know that you're not overspending in those little subcategories, but that's the overall concept of the profit first method. So again, you guys can choose one of these methods. You can choose multiple of these methods, but you wanna make sure that you have some sort of system, some sort of framework for how you're going to implement your budget to make sure that you're staying on track. And now we've made it to step six, which is adjust as needed and review. Now remember, this is a budget, right? So although we can implement the budget right now, we can make up a budget today and start it tomorrow, it's gonna take time for our savings to compile, right? It's gonna take time for us to dwindle down uh, some of these expenses that we've had for years. So when we get to the reviewing phase, now we can review this once a week. We could, we could, but let's be honest. How many times do you pay your mortgage in a month? Or how many times do you pay a, a car note, right? How many times do you go grocery shopping? Right? Now you may go grocery shopping once a week, but you may do it every two weeks. You may do it once a month. And so when we go from week to week, not a lot is going to change. Right? And we, some of our things are automatically debited out of our account. And so some may come the first week, some may come the third week, so forth and so on. But they only happen once or maybe twice a month. So when it comes to reviewing, we don't need to burden ourselves by looking every week. We do want to look at least once a month. Now, once a month, what we're going to be able to see is, okay, hey, we set a budget. Did we follow this budget? Are we actually under budget or, or did we go over budget? And now we can ask ourselves, well, why? Why did we go over budget? Or if you went under budget, what am I going to do with the extra money? Maybe I'll take that extra money and move it towards savings, right? Or I move it towards whatever is going to get me closer to my goal, right? So let's say it's paying down debt. And let's say you do have $300 a month that you pay towards debt every single month because you've created a category for that. Well, now all of a sudden you're under budget, right? By let's say another $1,000. What do you do with that $1,000? You could take that $1,000 and pay down more debt right? And then we just start it over. You can put in reserve, whatever you want, right? It's your money, whatever you want. But you have to ask yourselves, what do I do with the extra? Or if I went over, why did I go over and what can I do to make it different? Now we're reviewing at least once a month, but now let's talk about adjusting. Now, hey, look, what happens between a week to week, you know, that's, that's irrelevant, right? Because so many things can happen randomly. Maybe you got to go get gas. Maybe your wheel fell off the car. You got to get a new oil change. And maybe you had an apartment fire, God forbid, right? Some Something could have happened. Now what happens within a month, yeah, okay, now we get a little bit more of a snapshot, but again, maybe you got an oil change that month. Well, we only need an oil change every however many months or once a, you know, once a year, whatever the case is, depending on your car, and yeah, blah, blah, all that good stuff. But what happens in a month isn't necessarily predictive of what's gonna happen next month, right? So this is what we like to do. Now this is gonna be in the finance world on a professional side, and what's gonna make it simple for you is we're going to make adjustments every three months, right? Every quarter. You can just think of it that way. So January, February, March, we're going to look at everything. We're going to make adjustments to start on April 1st. Now, the reason we do this is because just like we said, we can collect more data over those three months. And now we got a good idea of, you know what? I've been stopping by the gas station a lot more than I should be. 
I spent $1,200 in three months on M&Ms and beef jerky, right? And I'm a sucker for beef jerky, that's why I say that one. But you know, you get to see where you're spending your money at. Then with that data, yeah, you say, okay, I, I'm gonna tighten this budget more. I'm gonna spend less on miscellaneous, right? Or you can see that you've been spending less in certain categories and you had a lot of extra left. So maybe you say, you know what? I'm gonna drop my budget from, let's just say 2,000. I'm gonna drop that sucker to 1,500 because I've been seeing consistently that I'm not going over 1,500. So I'm gonna drop that and now I'm gonna put another $500, right? That difference into another category. Now you can start to have much more control over your spending and now you can feel empowered to go out and say no to this, right? Or to create a goal with strategy and steps to get to your savings, your debt pay down, whatever the case is. And all it is, is a change of mindset. And matter of fact, if that makes sense to you, then go ahead and check out my Mindset to Make Money playlist right over here.